Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Cold War Prepper this evening. We have such a fantastic honor. Um, I'm going to, whoever recommended that I interview Franklin Horton, thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, because I told you I would not interview him until I read at least one or two of his books. Well, I read one, and that wasn't enough. I had to read two, I had to read three, and now, now we've got um, this collection, so I've done... Uh, Two of the Mad Mix series. I've done three of the, the uh, um, Locker 9 series. I just started, um, I finished The Borrowed World here just recently and just started Ashes of the Unspeakable, which is volume two of The Borrowed World. Uh, and just started that one today. And then I felt kind of dumb because some of the questions I'm going to ask uh, uh, Mr. Horton are actually answered in the book, uh, in, in the prologue to his book on, on uh, volume two of the, of the uh, Borrowed World series. But what a great, I mean, I have read a lot of post-apocalyptic fiction. I am hooked. I am totally hooked. Not only am I hooked, but I've got my wife hooked on it. So, uh, so that's a major accomplishment. So to all of my viewers, I would like to introduce to you Mr. Franklin Horton from the uh, Southwest mountains of Virginia and uh, let him tell you a little bit about himself and, and uh, some of the information that might get you hooked on him as well. So Mr. Horton, go ahead. Let's, let's hear a little bit about you. Well, thanks for that kind introduction. I'm really uh, pleased to hear that you got hooked on my books because as somebody who enjoys writing, that's the best compliment that you can get is for somebody to just really get immersed and sucked into your books. But uh, as you said, I'm from the southwest corner of Virginia, which is the little intersection of Virginia with Tennessee and Kentucky and North Carolina. Um, I grew up in this area. I've kind of ventured out and lived in different places over the years. But this is uh, I live in an area right now that's within an hour of where I was born. Um, <clears throat> I've always wanted to be a writer. Uh, I probably from the time I was 13 years old, wanted to write books. But it took me a while to actually, uh, you know, to make it happen. The Borrowed World ended up being the seventh book that I'd written. Uh, but the first books, they just, I was never able to find an agent for those and a market for those. And, you know, they tell people to write what they love. So I eventually started writing survival fiction because that's what I enjoyed writing the most or enjoyed reading the most. So once I started writing that, it just kind of took off. And uh, it's it's been a train ride since then that there's no getting off of. It's just been crazy. Uh, but I really enjoyed it. And uh I, I think the books have a good following, and I hear from a lot of readers that they enjoy them. So that's just uh, music to my ears. Well, fantastic. So, so you and I were talking a little bit before the show, and uh, you know, one of the questions that that I wanted to kind of ask you is: we a lot of times people will have um, an identity or an affinity with a character, and uh, for some reason, and not knowing you that well. Uh, of course, not knowing you at all, other than through your writing, I just get this feeling that there is this uh, simpatico between Franklin Horton and Jim Powell. So of all the characters in your books, which one do you think you have the closest uh, relationship or affinity or identity with? Yeah, it's definitely Jim Powell of The Borrowed World. Uh, <clears throat> that was the first book in this fictional universe because my Mad Mix series, my Locker 9 series, and my Borrowed World series all take place in the same event. You're just following different, different groups of characters who experience it differently. Uh, but The Borrowed World was the first one I wrote, and I decided the easiest way to write it was to write about my own life basically uh, i was working the same job that jim powell was working in those books uh it a lot of the characters are my real life friends it's written in my neighborhood in my house uh, my family is in it you know i changed the names of everybody but it was written very true to my life because i was uh in a job where i had to travel to northern virginia and richmond uh once or twice a month 
right after 9-11. And it just gave you a lot of food for thought of thinking, well, what if I was up here and something happened that I got stuck here? Uh, and right after Katrina, we saw that was a real possibility. You know, people in New Orleans getting stuck in the yeah. Superdome with their luggage, and they they were not prepared for that. They hadn't planned for that. So uh, because I did a lot of hiking and backpacking, I decided, well, I'm just going to start taking my backpacking gear with me on those trips. If the worst happens, I'll just throw my pack on and walk home. So I wrote a book that was very much from that uh that plan. And that's, that's exactly how I carried it out. And I tried to think as I went along, uh, you know, I, I went mile for mile on Google maps and from my memory of my trips, uh, thinking, okay, if I get here, what happens? If I get here, what happens? Where am I going to get on the Appalachian trail? So it's, it's a, a very much true to life book, both in terms of the geography and in terms of uh, its relationship to me. So, so typically when we talk to people, we, we say, uh, are you primarily a hunker down kind of a guy or a, a bug out kind of a guy? <clears throat> but the way you're articulating it is you were more of a get home guy. Is that safe? Yeah, very much in that book, uh, because, you know, I lived in an area in the country that I felt was pretty sustainable. You know, we had a very uh, private home. Uh, I had availability of plenty of fresh water. There was game. We had surrounded by thousands of cows. Uh, you know, it was just a good place. But I realized that I could be stuck on the road when some event happened. Uh, and with a lot of people, you know, you always assume that everybody in your family doesn't have to be uh, all in on your prepping because you're like, oh, well, I'm there. I know how to do this. I know how to do that. I know how to, I know where all my preps are. I know where the things are that I've hidden that I didn't tell anybody I spent money on. Uh, but what if you're not home? So that book was written with the idea that the guy who had kind of planned how everything would work was going to be away from home. So he kind of wrote a plan for his wife of, he's like, it's fine if she's not on board. I just want something there that tells her what to do if I'm not there. So it's about him getting home, but also her, about her putting his preps into action and uh, figuring out how to run the house without him there. But you see that same level of detail planning in Locker 9 because, you know, you've got, you've got this basically daughter away from the college and dad goes out and rents a locker. Uh, supplies it with all the equipment, gives her a detailed list of instructions on uh, what to do, where to go, who to see, uh, how to travel, and everything else. So I think I think one of the things that's key that I'm seeing is that you are a very detail-oriented person as far as having very well thought out plans, lists, uh, instructions. Uh, you probably even use the PACE method, the primary alternate contingency and emergency plans. So that uh, you've got you've got all these different things, these different directions on a decision tree that you could possibly do, and just the amount of detail is unbelievable. Well, you know, part of how that came about was I was working for a government agency where, <clears throat> you know, as with Jim Powell in those books, I worked in a, a state mental health agency. Part of my job was I managed the construction and properties end. So I would uh, arrange for a contractor to build a new office building. And then as our people were getting ready to move in, I had to prepare an operations manual for them that told them everything of, you know, what kind of light bulbs they used, where the emergency shutoffs were, where the breaker boxes were. So I started applying that to my own life. And that's where the uh, that level of detail came in. And as far as Locker 9, uh, the origins of it, I was doing a, a prepper show and your previous guest, Chris Weatherman, and I were sharing a booth there. And somebody came up and they said, you know, I've read your Borrowed World book, but my situation doesn't concern me as much as my daughter in college. And so that kind of planted the seeds. Well, what oh, wow. would I do? Yeah, what would I do if it was me? So I started figuring, okay, my daughter is in a non-permissive environment where she can't have a weapon. She doesn't have space for a lot of preps. What would I do for her? But at the same time, I don't want her uh, siphoning these preps off every time, you know, she needs a snack or she needs a little money or she's low on fuel. So the character in that book doesn't tell her about all the preparations. She doesn't find out about them until you know, this emergency takes place. And 
I am proud to say, you know, that there are people who carry out plans similar to that every year because they send me pictures. They're like, this is my locker nine. This girl is my grace. Uh, this is, I've, I've followed your book. And I, and especially, you know, one aspect of that book is developing a, kind of a route for your child that takes advantage of existing relationships you have. You know, this dad built a route for his daughter that was based on, you know, uh, work friends, relatives, you know, he's, and this is something that came from my own life, because if you grew up in that pre-cell phone age and you broke down on the road, you were kind of at the mercy of strangers. So my parents were like, well, if you break down close to this place, you know, I know a guy that you can go check in with, but if it's close to this other town, there's a cousin there you can go visit. So I started applying that and he built a route for her, uh, taking advantage of those existing relationships. And he included a picture of that person, an address and, you know, what, what his relationship to that person was. And so that became her, her safety route home. And she had a primary route and she had alternate routes too, in case there was some, uh, you know, uh, hazard she ran into or in case one route wasn't safe. Absolutely. Let, let me uh, welcome a couple of fantastic subscribers who are here with us this evening. Diana, too, welcome. Uh, Little Lone Prepper. And and um, I'm almost done with the book. So, um, um, and uh, thank you for that, Diana. Uh, Triple G Farms, always great to see you. Thank you, buddy. I'm always so happy to see you as well. Clarity Jane 31. Uh, let me see. I don't see any questions yet. So I think we're going to go ahead and, and keep on going here because, uh, gosh, what great books. <clears throat> let me tell you, you know, I, I think I keep telling everybody, uh, I got involved in prepping as a result of, of the Cuban Missile Crisis in 1962. Uh, I was a young, impressionable 10 year old. My next door neighbor was the neighborhood block warden for civil defense, and he was building a, a, a cinder block fallout shelter in his backyard. So I just got into uh, nuclear defense and fallout shelters and everything else. I just totally got immersed in it. And then I've been living that for 50 years. But let me tell you a secret. It doesn't matter how long you've been doing something. Keep your eyes, ears, and mind open because there's always somebody who has thought of something. Hello, Tracy Muck and Fuss. Uh, there's always somebody who has thought of something that you never thought of. So in the very first book, uh, Mr. Hortons, that I read, uh, which is um, Locker 9. We were just talking about it. One of the key things that that I just really, really grabbed me as one of those key, ah, crap, why didn't I ever think of that, was to take a marker with you. So if you have to walk home, always write on the backside of the road signs with your initials and the date and where you're going to next. And then that will let anybody who's looking for you know where you were and which direction you were headed uh, as they look, go up and down the roads, the interstates or whatever. I thought, what a brilliant piece, just, just written in there subtly in the, uh, in, in the story that just, what a great piece of information to have and what a great one to, uh, to, to keep with you. Uh, hello, Butch Graves, welcome. So uh, is it safe to say, Mr. Horton, that you've probably been in this now since uh, you brought up 9-11 and you brought up Hurricane Katrina. So so were those probably the most influential getting you into uh, uh, prepping? Those were probably the events that helped me put a name to it. But I grew up in a rural area where we didn't, you know, nobody had cable there when I was growing up. Uh, losing electricity was kind of a common thing. Uh, your well water going out was kind of a common thing. Uh, so we had a lot of these preps in place at the time for, you know, what's your contingency for cooking dinner if the power's out? You know, what's your contingency for heating the house if the power's out? You know, what are you going to do if this happens? So there was always the kind of idea in the back of your head that you have to be prepared to take care of things if you don't have, you know, the utilities that you're used to. Uh, but also growing up in the Appalachian Mountains, there were a lot of uh, people still living at that time who, lived uh, 
a lifestyle where they raised their own food. Uh, they would go to the store, you know, once a month and they would buy salt and flour and a few other things. But most of their food uh, came from, you know, their, their property and they didn't have uh, running water. Some of them had outhouses and little yeah. springs in the backyard. So that kind of stuff really heavily influenced me. So I think uh, growing up, there was always a, a being prepared was seen as a value and and not as something that you kind of adopted. It was something that was just always ingrained in you that you had to be prepared for you know, taking care of yourself because there was nobody else to depend on. You know, you might have friends and family, but the the final safety is up to you. Yeah, it sounds like it was part of your normal life. One hundred percent, and it was it w- wasn't just part of our family's life, but it was what you saw with everybody else, and it was just a a traditional value of that region. It's like Alaskans, you know, uh, those people that grow up there with a. Uh, uh, survival skills ingrained in them don't think anything of it and it was kind of the same here you know we didn't have the isolation of alaska but it was just always something that was uh, in the backdrop of your life yeah i have a nephew who uh, actually my wife's nephew who, who left uh central texas to become an alaska state trooper in nome alaska so we'll have to talk to him sometime about what they do for preps up in alaska um, so anyhow, uh, Diana too has a question for, for us, and that's with the rapid advance of AI, where they can copy your voice and likeness, have you considered ways to authenticate communications with your family? Uh, I have not included that in any of my books, but but there are, uh, especially in Mad Mick, as that series advances, there are AI uh tools that are used to deceive the public and to deceive other people. Uh, it, it becomes a way to manipulate people uh, because of these uh, deep fake videos, you know, that uh, you can, your own eyes are fooling you. But that would probably be something that, that as those technologies get available to more people, there would be a need for that, but you could rely on things that only your family would know because AI would only have available what's on the internet. So if you have things that uh, never made it to the internet, those would be the things to rely on. Absolutely, especially things like nicknames or or things like that, that, uh, you know, to ask. Net names. To, yeah, yeah. And, and so very, very good suggestions. Great. I was thinking more, and this is the crypt analyst, I mean, more like an authentication system. Uh, where you could come up with some pre-generated uh, five-digit characters or five alphanumeric characters and and use one as a challenge and the other as a reply, and then you would have those with you. Uh, you know, you'd only probably need five or ten of those and keep those in a, in a – you could keep those on a card in your wallet, and that would be uh, pretty good. Diana, too, says that she grew up in, in – I'm going to say – I'm going to guess Giles County or is it Giles County? Giles County, yeah. Giles County? Um so let's, we've got these, these uh, 13, 14 people here on right now. And if they were, if they were going to start reading Franklin Horton books. Uh, now, my experience is uh, when, one of my, when one of my subscribers said to interview you and, and I said, I want to read your books. I was totally enamored with the name Mad Mick. And so I, I, I ordered it off Amazon. And then I found out you had a website. I went to your website and it said, Mad Mick gets introduced as a character in volume two, Grace Under Fire of the Locker 9 series. So I said, oh, crap. Now I need to go order volume <laughs> one and two of the Locker 9 series. So based off of what you said on your website, I, I read three books before I got to read, finished reading the one I wanted to start with. And I'm totally hooked on all of them, by the way. Excellent. Uh, and, and then The Borrowed World, uh, I noticed that it said, you know, if, if you really want uh, ideas around preparedness, you know, where, where it's it's more preparedness planning and action than suspense. Uh, then, then the borrowed world is probably your your the, the best series to go to. So I got book one of that done. And, oh my God, you are absolutely right. So let's take all that aside and or, or put it into the, the bowl and say, if these guys here wanted to start off reading your books. Where would you recommend that they start? <clears throat> well, the borrowed world is more about 
an individual situation. It's more about uh, if you're the person you're concerned about and you want to read a story about how you can improve your situation and uh, techniques that you can use uh, in your own life, that's the series for you. Uh, Locker 9 was written as a series for people who were more concerned about their child. Uh, there, you know, it could be your your son who lives a couple of counties away. It could be your daughter who's in college 500 miles away. Uh, and of course, there are things within that that you can use in your in your own life in any situation. It's also written uh, a little less violent. So it was written to be a book that you could give to your teenager, you know, that could maybe introduce them to a preparedness mindset. Uh, Mad Mick is its own thing. I mean, it takes place in that same world, but this is a guy who uh, has a military contractor kind of assassin background, uh, and he lives in this same fictional universe as those other two series. But he, through this series, I'm able to explore a lot of the subterfuge and the, the government and political manipulation that's still going on uh, while the power is out and the news is out. Because as far as government is concerned, this is the time for them to even the scores. So everybody is trying to kill their enemies because there's no news cycle. So, right, you know, right. with nobody watching, they can do whatever they want. So the Mad Mix stories are a way to kind of explore the larger world and the whole uh, geopolitical scene, whereas Borrowed World and Locker 9 are more zoomed in personal uh, family stories. Can you pronounce a name for me in, in, in Mad Mick? Sure. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> The adopted son of, of Mick. Oh, yeah. This is interesting. Uh, I use a lot of stuff from my real life. So uh, I met a, a kid one time whose name was Rages, R-A-G-U-S. And it wasn't until I'd known him sometime that one of the other kids told me his name was the word sugar spelled backward. But he didn't like to tell people that because obviously, you know, people picked on him and made fun of him. But his mother named him Sugar Backwards because she thought he was so sweet. Oh, geez. Yeah. That's great. So it's Rageous. Okay. Rageous. Yeah. I wasn't sure if it was Ragus or Ragus or. And yeah. So thank uh, you very much for that. Uh, yeah, I, I think he's an interesting character because, uh, you know, he's he's gone through a lot in his own life. Oh, yeah. And, and, and certainly a, a person of conviction. Yeah, uh, that's that's definitely brought out. Hello, KP Heathen from Louisiana and Simple Times. Simple Times says, uh, read your books and and like them all. Thank you for what you've shared. Thank you. Uh, for reading Greengrass them. Grows is welcome. Uh, glad to see you here as well. Um, so let's kind of take what you've written. And, and, and you said uh, World World was kind of 2015 ish when you when you got it published. Yeah, I started writing it probably in 2013, and it was 2015 before I had it ready for public viewing. So, so Locker Nine, and it, it appears all of these are based off of a series of small attacks. Any one of which, all by, in and of itself, would not be that significant. But when you have a whole bunch of small attacks in large numbers, it devastates the U.S. And um, there's there's allusions to it being extremist, Islamic, I guess, ISIS extremist. And uh, but if we take a look at what's going on in the world today, and especially in lieu of uh, there's these two Chinese colonels, I, I forget their names, but uh, they're from the People's Liberation Army Navy. And they wrote about unrestricted warfare or how they're going to have all these things happening in the U.S. that we won't be able to connect the dots and say, hey. They're attacking us. They're taking us down. And we probably had somewhere in the vicinity of, guesses are, between eight and 30,000 uh, unaccompanied Chinese of military age, uh, well-dressed, and obviously didn't trek across the Sonoran Desert to get to the uh, crossing points, who have entered into the U.S. So how much predictive were you of probably what the Chinese might be doing? We've had... Uh, we've had at least uh, five uh, attempts to derail trains or successful derailment of trains in the last three days. 
Um, you know, I mean, when you start taking a look at stuff, I think you may have had a very good point for the basis of your books, uh, just the wrong group of people. Instead of ISIS, it's going to be the Chinese. What are your thoughts about that? Well, you know, in those books, I talk about uh, the idea of these small infrastructure attacks being influenced by a television show. And that was 100 percent true. There was a show that was on, I think it was the Discovery Channel or the Learning Channel, that presented the top 10 infrastructure vulnerabilities in the United States. And I was thinking, well, I hope, you know, there's no terrorists sitting there scribbling this all on a notepad, uh, you know, because it, it, it did very clearly demonstrate what a lot of vulnerabilities were. But yeah, that has become less of a threat over time. But you know, the Chinese situation is is totally, uh, it, it's coming from a lot of fronts. And as you said, with all these people coming into the country, they can basically irritate us to death through these small series of attacks, but also through the way they're manipulating uh, people and kind of turning groups of people against each other through disinformation campaigns and psychological warfare campaigns. Uh, there's a guy who's influenced my thought a lot recently named Peter Zihon. Yes. And uh, yeah, because, because one of the things he talks about that's really interesting is that because of this one family, one child policy in China, they're about to go off this cliff where their population is going to drop precipitously. So they really only have somewhere less than 20 years to make their big moves uh, because then their population is going to drop, their army is going to drop, you know, a lot of the, they're, they're going to be restricted as to any big campaigns they're going to start. So besides, you know, sending people across their borders, one of the interesting things they've done is, uh, you know, in Africa and in South America and Central America, American and European banks don't want to invest money in infrastructure projects because we don't see them as safe. So China has filled that gap and they're funding, you know, the majority of the roads that are being built in Africa now. They're funding the dams, they're building schools. Uh, and as they're doing this, they are establishing footprints throughout the world. Uh, the other thing is to provide security for these uh, infrastructure projects, they train local people in you know, military tactics and some of the basics of acting as a guard. Uh, and then that creates a need for weapons, which they then sell to these countries. So China is, that is one way of establishing a footprint. And, and during COVID and, and our periods of distraction over elections and all that, China has slowly put their stamp around the world to where uh, everywhere that we have reduced our presence, they have increased their presence. So yeah, they're they're coming after us on all fronts. I've I've been a big proponent of trying to to stop the disinformation about another red about a red dawn happening in the U.S. <clears throat> Number one, the uh, the Chinese neither the Chinese nor the Russians have enough airlift capability to get more than one division across the oceans, provided uh, that they make it through all our anti aircraft defenses. And uh, once they get here, it's a suicide mission. They don't have any air to air refueling capabilities, so. It, it's a dead plane on the ground unless they get it refueled and they aren't going to go back and get more. So resupply is going to be very tenuous. Um, the Chinese don't have the range to even get here in the first place. So they have to get somewhere in between. Then when we take a look at their uh, uh, ability to land with seaborne assault landing craft, um, the, the Russians have basically lost a third of what they had, which was only about a brigade size uh, in uh, the Black Sea. Uh, they, they've been sank by the Ukrainians and the Chinese don't have any ocean going. They're all basically intercoastal uh, aimed primarily at Taiwan. So they can't get anybody over here. Well, guess what? Lee needs to change his thinking because as you just pointed out, uh, you know, there's that relationship now with Panama, with Venezuela, with Nicaragua, with Cuba. Yeah. And so we're seeing all of these uh, establishments of, of, of forces uh, being made in Central South America and in the Caribbean uh, and the Gulf of Mexico so that now we're just a stone's throw away and the Chinese could very easily do it, not necessarily in the next year or two, but probably within the next five, they'll be very capable of doing a red dawn on the U.S. 
Yeah. And, you know, they've even established relationships with the cartel because, you know, for the longest time they were bringing in Chinese fentanyl and the cartels were buying it and smuggling it across the border to sell in the United States. And then through a pure measure of trying to establish goodwill, uh, China was like, how come, how about us bringing you the precursor chemicals? You buy those from us and you can make the fentanyl yourself and increase your profits. And they had no motivation to do that other than establishing goodwill with the cartels and with the Mexican government. So they have, uh, you know, built all this goodwill just across the border that will one day come back to bite us. Oh, I'm sure. I, I'm, I'm 100% sure. Hello, Pete. Uh, so Pete, the roaming prepper just joined us and, and he and I have had a lot of discussions about what we're talking about as well. Uh, he's out in Odessa, Midland area. So, so Mr. Horton, what are your top five priorities uh, for prepping for SHTF? <laughs> oh, I, I made a list here because uh, I wanted to make sure that <laughs> Um, so I assume that in this question, we were talking about, uh, like, you know, what, what types of products and gear and all that stuff. And, you know, I, I assume that water needs to be first. So, uh, I always tell people have multiple methods of hydration because you see people, uh, go into crisis a lot of times just from, uh, you know, a small utility interruption, you know, not being able to get water. And uh, we grew up with this as a common situation because we had several houses on one well. So, you know, it was always going down. So we always had to have water put back. But, you know, now, besides having water put back, I also want to have an alternative method and, and a way of filtering that water, which, uh, because I came from a, a backpacking background uh, rather than a military background. For me, uh, I used what's called a SteriPen, which is the little UV light. So if I'm in an area like where I live now, where we have good flowing water most of the year, I use a SteriPen to sanitize my water. But if it, it gets to August and September when those springs aren't flowing as well and you might have to drink out of standing water or river or whatever, then I use a good filter, which a, a Katadyne hiker is what I had used for most of my backpacking trips. And it's lasted me 30 years with no breakdowns, so I, I still have a loyalty to it. Uh, <clears throat> but then, of course food safety, you know, having your short and long-term food storage, uh, methods of cooking, uh, you know, everybody should have multiple uh, ways to cook because it doesn't do you any good to have your food storage if you have no way to cook it. Uh, also, an alternative way of heating your house because, you know, we, we looked at that situation. I guess this affected you all in Texas a couple of years ago when you had that wave of uh, freezing temperatures that swooped through and people's pipes were freezing. You know, a $99 kerosene heater could prevent something like that, you know. Uh, so here where I live, you know, with a lot of power line between me and the next house, a wood stove is a necessity. So uh, besides those things, I also include self-defense, but I don't really look at that as a preparation. I don't look at that as prepping. I think that's just kind of a basic uh, value that everyone should have is the ability to defend yourself and protect your family. So, you know, I include that in prepping for people who don't have that, but I think that should be kind of a value, kind of a basic uh, life skill that everyone has is some ability, uh, whether it's through, you know, uh, martial arts or whatever, or through, you know, your weapons to protect yourself. So I include that in here, but I'm just a big believer in uh, raising children to be safe around guns. You know, uh, when my kids were little, sometimes I would lay out whatever I was carrying on the table and I'm like, you know, how do you know this is loaded or unloaded? You know, how do you know how to get the magazine out? You know, uh, does taking the magazine out uh, change what's in the chamber? You know, how do you tell if there's still something in the chamber? Because I wanted them to know the basics of gun handling. So, you know, safety is a, Safety is where to start. Great. Well, let, let's. I want to. I want to welcome a couple more people. So we got roaming prepper here. We've also got Diana too. Has a question. 
and then uh, Prepping with Sarge just joined us. Now, Prepping with Sarge, you, you two would should get along extremely well. He's in uh, the mental health field of work in South Carolina. So he's not very far from you. He's a great uh, prepper. He's really into foraging, which kind of comes along with your uh, hiking experience and all that kinds of stuff. So uh, I think the two of you would really, really get along extremely well and, and not too far from each other. But I want to carry on that subject of, of, of weapons. And so if we take a look at Jim, uh, Jim carries an LCP and he also carries a Beretta. I'm going to guess an M9. So tell me, tell me about, because I, I already know that Jim and you are probably, you know, so close together, it's pitiful. Uh, so, so, so what does Jim Horton carry? Well, when I wrote those books, uh, I felt a little loyalty to the Beretta because most of the guns I had throughout my life were hand-me-downs or, you know, somebody's, some old relative has given you something, you know, like a, a 22 short pistol or something, you know, some obsolete something. So the first gun that I ever went out and bought new was a Beretta 92. And uh, that was probably 1989 or something. So, I wanted to use that because so many people uh, in a lot of the books I was reading were using Glocks and I don't have anything against Glocks. I have several Glocks, but I don't think the brand is as important as, you know, the basics of gun handling and, you know, actually having holsters for the weapons that you have because it's surprising how many people have weapons and no holsters or no Amen. slings. <laughs> so, uh, that's that's why. And also the LCP has just been one of those convenient little pistols that if I'm in a, uh, a non-permissive situation like, you know, cargo shorts or whatever, you can stick that in there in your little uh, pocket holster. It, it's basically just an oversized pocket gun. Yeah. And, you know, I have several of these old school uh, little pocket guns that people have given me over the years, like the Astra Cub, which was a little 22 short, you know, Saturday night special automatic. Um, the the Colt Jr., which was, I guess, a 25. I have one of those. But the LCP is just, you know, the only thing I don't like is it's, you know, it's 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 a crude gun. The trigger's not all that great. But, uh, you know, it, as far as being able to stick it in a pocket and go, that's uh, perfect. Yeah, and, and I think the other thing people don't consider is how to wear their holster and, uh, you know, where it's going to be most comfortable, whether you're driving or walking or, or anything like that. And uh, I'm becoming more and more uh, uh, inclined to a cross draw and uh, just a lot easier for me. Let you me know, people should but, experiment with that. It, you know, you, you, you don't lock into something because... Uh, because somebody else is doing it or because it's a favorite character of yours in a book is doing it. People need to try holsters and wear them and see what's comfortable. That, I'm a big believer in, you know, actually wear it and try it and see what works for you. So, so Diana too wants to know, are you primarily a bug in guy? And if so, what would make you leave? Well, yeah, I am a bug in guy because I live way out in the country. I'm surrounded by woods and cattle farms on all sides. You know, we have a little livestock ourselves. We have good water sources, plenty of firewood. Uh, I think we could sustain ourselves for a pretty good time here. But basically, it would take my area being overrun to force me out because my neighbors are mostly country people. But uh, they all love to shoot because we kind of have this thing that, you know, if one of us is out shooting at our range and making a little noise, it spreads throughout the neighborhood. Somebody else is like, man, I could be out shooting too. So the next thing you know, they're outside shooting. And then the guy over that way is shooting too. So uh, <clears throat> I feel like I have decent neighbors. We're all, you know, hermits, but we're friendly with each other. So it, it, it would take a, you know, a strong enemy presence here to make me want to leave. Yeah, Utah Mike is, is adding to our previous discussion, water, shelter, and sanitation. I think sanitation is probably one of the most overlooked aspects of, of prepping. But uh, I, I tell you what, in 1997, and, and you were right, we, we've had two snowmageddons or ice mageddons here in Central Texas. In 1997, lightning hit our, our sewage pumping station. So instead of pumping the sewage up over the hill and, and then gravity feeding it into the sanitation uh, system for the city of Austin, uh, we out in the country, uh, it just puddled. 
and then it got seeped into our drinking water supply. So uh, uh, that was probably, you know, that my first uh, ex exposure to what poor sanitation can do and, and having fecal matter in your drinking water was cryptosporidiosis, and that was not pleasant at all. Um, so prepping with Sarge uh, agrees about getting a good holster. Uh, Pete, the roaming prepper, says he has multiple holsters for each of his uh, carry pieces, depending upon his attire. That's prepper my book system also. Prepper Book Club, welcome, welcome. Good to see you as well. So I, was it, Pepper Book Club, was it you that recommended that I uh, that I read the uh, uh, Franklin Horton series and, and get him on as an interview? If so, thank you very, very much for doing that. Um, what are one or two of, of, of the mistakes that you say, oh, crap, I hope that other people can learn from my mistakes and never do this stupid thing? One of my biggest ones was investing in cheap-ass plastic shelving. <laughs> Um, you know, it's hard to say, uh, because I've had a lot of learning experiences, uh, like finding a cheap piece of gear and thinking, well, this will help me get by, you know, until I can afford something better. But then it being such a inferior piece of gear that it wasn't even worth the money I spent on it. You know, there have been multiple examples of that over the years, but, uh, <clears throat> I guess what I've learned is, you know, uh, trying to buy, it, it was better to save for the piece of gear that I needed. Uh, but also, like, <clears throat> it's easy for people to uh, get distracted by weapons because they're a lot cooler than the other things. But, you know, having a good flashlight in my everyday carry has been way more life-changing to me than my weapons because I use the flashlight way more often. So uh, it's it's easy for people to get sucked into the allure of having, you know, 25 rifles and, you know, 300,000 rounds of ammunition. But, you know, remember all the other aspects of preparedness too and don't get too narrowly focused into the, the glitzy, sparkly weaponry uh, and just see that as one component of a very broad spectrum of things that you need to have. Fantastic advice. So um, let's say that there's a brand new prepper here tonight and they want to know, how do I get involved in this stuff? Is there one particular path of books that you would recommend that they start with and just say, okay, come up with a plan, start doing this now. Well, I think that if you're a person who doesn't see the value in it, you're not sure if this is something that you want to explore, then I recommend the fiction first. Books like my books, books like, you know, Angry Americans books. There are a lot of good series out there because those books pre present you with scenarios where you can see the value in preparation. Uh, it, it puts you in the mindset, uh, because I know a lot of people who, whose spouses have been brought along by reading the fiction. You know, they see, oh, well, I see how this could be important now. So That's I, I yeah, <laughs> and, and it's, it's not always the man who's the prepper. It's not always the woman who's the prepper. It varies, you know, from family to family. And there are a lot of spouses out there who just don't see it and don't want to spend the money on it. And I think the fiction is a good tool for bringing them along. But if, they're already, if you're already a person who knows this is important and you want to go down that road, then there's a lot of good nonfiction out there, like uh, James Wesley Rawls' nonfiction books uh, mm -hmm. are, are, are a pretty good uh, source of, like, the basics of food preser uh, preparation and, you know, area intelligence and things like that. Uh, but there's also so much free information on the internet, uh, I would probably discourage people from a lot of the Facebook groups because there are some good ones, but then there are other ones where people just fight all the time. And it, you know, if you, if you don't like that level of confrontation, uh, it can be just frustrating to watch people argue nonstop over, you know, what you should have in your bag. I, a couple of years ago on my Facebook page, before I got kicked off, um, <laughs> 
I, I, I asked a simple question. I said, which prepping knife is best to scale a trout? And I let that argument go on for three days on Facebook before I finally said, okay, guys, you don't, you don't scale trout. You just fillet them. <laughs> and I mean, these guys were dead set in their values over which knife was best to fillet, to, uh, to, 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 to uh, scale a trout. I mean, just simple little things like that tell you who knows what they're talking about. And there's so many people out there giving bad advice. It's yeah. And, you know, when you're just starting out, that can be overwhelming. So get out there. What? There's tons of good YouTube videos. There are a lot of good channels. Uh, you can tell by by the how many followers people have quite often if they have something worth saying and that people are interested in. But doing it through Facebook groups alone is just mind numbing because it's trolls and overwhelming amount of information you know start simple don't let it become something overwhelming and you know the whole idea of preparing for an shtf event can be overwhelming so yeah. you got to do it in little bite-sized pieces you don't see it as okay i've got to do this in the next year because something bad could happen you see it as a change in your lifestyle and you're going to do a little bit every day to get yourself more to the place that you want to be we, we got married my last day. Actually, it was the day I was supposed to sign out of the unit when I was teaching at Goodfellow Air Force Base. And so we got married on January 16th. And I, I went over to Germany. And my battalion commander helped my wife get her passport and everything else, a military ID card and everything after I left. And so for the first six months, she was in the States and I was over on a remote intercept site uh, on the east-west German border. And uh, so when she first got there, she was totally immersed into, into prepping uh, by force by the Army because we had something called NEO, NEO, the Non-Combatant Evacuation Orders. And so every because we were afraid that the, the East Germans and 20 divisions of Soviets in East Germany and five divisions of Soviets in Czechoslovakia were going to come across the Fulda Gap, Gap or the North German Plains or anything like that, they had to have a bug out bag with all their documentation, medical records and everything else available so that they could pick it up and leave uh, the house within 10 minutes of notification. So that's the kind of exposure that she had. Well, she thought it was all a joke until she found out that I'm really into it. And so uh, she's let me do some weird things. She's let me spend a lot of money, you know, solar system and, and rain catchment system and, and uh, other things. And um, the only thing she ever balks at is when I tell her I need another gun. But, uh, you know. <laughs> But, you know, when people, you can't prepare with uh, this goal that you want to be prepared for the end of the world, because you, you may not ever face a red dawn type disaster, but everybody is going to be affected by weather at some point. Everybody is going to be affected by utility outages at some point. So, you know, I, I would encourage people to start by preparing for those little basic things and then build on that as you go. But we're all going to, you know, be stuck in an ice storm at home sometimes. So, you know, prepare for those and then that gets you on the road. So Prepping with Sarge says that you're absolutely right. The Facebook groups are full of trolls and couch experts. Um, <laughs> And then Prepper Book Club wants to know, as an aspiring author, would love to know what Franklin does to be productive in his writing or his process. <clears throat> well, you know, you and I talked about this a little bit before we came on the air, which is when I wrote that first book, uh, you know, I, I was a kid who at 13 years old wanted to be an author. So I'd been writing stories for years. So I enjoyed doing this. But when I eventually decided that I was going to write a, a post-apocalyptic book and I was seriously devoting myself to this, I had young kids and I had a full-time job and I had a contractor's license. So I was doing construction on the side, little remodeling projects and stuff. So the only time I had during my day to write was my lunch hour. So I set a goal each day that during my lunchtime at work, I was going to write three pages. And if I could do three pages a day, then within a few months, I would have a, a, the basics of a book. I would have, you know, a certain number of pages and that would give me a starting point. So I did that. The book ended up 
people read it. Uh, it. It did well. So then the thing that I wasn't prepared for was that people immediately started saying, well, where's book two? So then <laughs> I had to turn up my, my speed and start writing more at night. I had to let some of my little side projects go. I had to, you know, quit doing contracting on the side. Eventually I got to where I could write about three books a year while I was still employed by writing a little bit in the morning, uh, writing at lunch, writing a little bit in the evening. Uh, but eventually in uh, 2019, I turned this into my full-time job. So now this is what I do eight to 10 hours a day. Wow. Fantastic. So <laughs> Tracy Muckenfuss was saying she had a deer in the headlight moment. that <laughs> out in Texas have skills. No, they, they don't. You know, and, and to be honest with you, back in the old days, we used to scale everything. Now we don't scale anything. Everything just, I just fillet everything. Uh, I don't know how other fishermen are, but, you know, why go to the process of leaving the skin on and and, uh, and having to scale it? Just fillet it and cook the meat. Um, so Pat's very impressed with you and and, and thanking for an excellent interview and, and your uh, outstanding uh, Thank comments you, Pat. here. Yeah, if you tell Mike, you're absolutely correct. Forgiveness is always easier to obtain than, than permission. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's kind of a philosophy of mine also. Okay, so when Prepping with Sarge, one of my heroes, uh, gets ready to finish his uh, interviews, he normally does some rapid-fire questions, and he'll ask things like, uh, what's your favorite, Star Wars or Star Trek? So we'll, we'll ask you a couple of rapid-fire questions here. So... We'll do a, a prepping with Sarge one because I'm sure he's on here, so I'm sure he wants to know. Which one would you go for, Star Wars or Star Trek? Uh, I was always a Star Trek fan. Oh, me too. <laughs> yeah. Uh, hunker Down or Bug Out? Uh, hunker Down. Your favorite SHTF movie? <clears throat> you know, I, I don't know if this qualifies, but for me it was, which was the movie 127 Hours. It was about the guy in Utah who was hiking in the slot canyons and got his arm pinned under a rock. And so wow. he eventually had to cut his own arm off with a Leatherman and hike out of there. And the, the thing that I liked about that and the reason to me that was an SHTF moment was because the guy was living his everyday life. The unexpected came upon him. The things that he had on him and in his pack were all he had and help was not coming. So it was all up to him. And he ended up, and there's a movie, 127 Hours, uh, the book, the movie, they're both good. But that is a devastating story about a guy who was just resilient and said, I'm saving my own life no matter what it takes. Wow. Okay. I'll have to, I'll have to check that one out. Oh, yeah. <coughs> okay. Your favorite folding knife. Uh, you know, I have some, uh, zero tolerance pocket knives that I really, really like. They're good, sturdy beasts of a knife, but like for my everyday beat around knife that I use here on the farm, it's usually a Kershaw just because they're inexpensive and they're rock solid. And for some reason, when I lose one, it always comes back to me. Oh, I tell you some of the, some of the knives I've lost, especially through, uh, TSA, it's, it's unbelievable. Uh, <laughs> Gosh, my dad. That's where I buy some knives. I go to these stores that sell the TSA uh, confiscations. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. And I've bought knives that way. Oh, you probably got one or two of mine. I might. Um, how about a favorite? Uh, and I'm going to guess at this one uh, favorite fixed blade knife. You know, uh, <clears throat> In the books, I use that that uh, Gerber LMF because that knife is tough as an anvil. You can't break it. Uh, you know, that is a, a good, solid knife. It's, it's kind of heavy. Uh, so, you know, if I'm in a long-term backpacking situation, I have some SE knives that I usually go with just because they're light. And, you know, they've got that good warranty that as long as you can send back a scrap, they're replacing it for you. Uh, yeah. A big fan of the Essie Azula knives. Uh, I carry one of those in a cross straw uh, a lot when I'm out because that is a that's a very good lightweight, discreet fixed blade. The the only thing I have against Essie, and and I, I tell you I have an Essie six and love it, absolutely love it. Uh, the only thing I have against them is the flat grind. Uh, I, I prefer a Scandi grind, but uh, you know that's. That's probably the only thing I could ever say anything even halfway bad about. But the you know, flat grind gets you gets the job taken care of just as easily, I guess. 
<clears throat> it's hard to pick a favorite anyway because there are so many good knives out there. Oh, yeah. I mean, I just have them laid out everywhere here, and that's a big decision for me each day is I like to rotate through them. So, you know, somebody has to get carry time. You know, I'll pick a new one each day. Yep, absolutely. Um, what's your favorite fire starting method? Uh, a lighter because, <laughs> <laughs> you know, seriously, I've uh, – you probably remember uh you know angry american chris weatherman he's real good friends with alan k that won the first season of alone and i've sat with alan several times and watched him build fires with his primitive methods and he always says you know this is to remind you of why you always carry two lighters with you you know because if you have to do it this way you have a new appreciation of what a lighter is is worth so i prefer a lighter but uh i also I like those blast matches, uh, which is, you know, kind of the ferro. You push it down and it sparks because those are simple for uh, most people to use. Uh, but I like those, but I'm I'm big on having lighters everywhere. I, I love Zippo lighters. Um, you know, just I, I, I put uh, when I was in the military, we even put Mogas in them and use Mogas to really to, interesting to power them. Yeah. So. Uh, you know, the, the bit came out later and it had gave a better taste when I was smoking cigarettes, but, uh, <laughs> but, uh, you know, uh, all in all, the, the Zippo, if you can't blow it out, it's going to be there. You're going to take care I like of that you can stand the Zippo up, you know, you can yeah. stand it up and leave it there burning. Absolutely. Um, what's your favorite food or, or nourishment that you, in your, in your bag? <laughs> you know, I use, uh, protein bars usually because they're pretty durable, uh, you know, different kinds of them. Just I rotate through different kinds, but because they're okay to eat if they've been squished or if they're out of date, you know, it doesn't seem to hurt them. But I'm also a big fan of those uh, energy gels like uh, endurance athletes and, uh, you know, cyclists use because it's basically just a caffeinated goo that you put in your mouth and it provides the electrolytes a little caffeine and some sugar to keep you going uh, i don't want anything that requires cooking or a lot of care i just want something you can have on the run yeah so and and your experience is primarily along the appalachian trail too right yeah i'm i'm pretty close here i'm within 30 minutes so a lot of uh I do a lot of section hiking, uh, used to do a lot more before the books kind of took over my life, but I like to go out and, you know, hit sections and do loops and hit some of the side trails. But, uh, you know, I like if most of my, uh, preparation plan was always for get home. So I didn't want to have to plan for cooking and catching fish and any of that. So mostly it was about speed and, uh, you know, covering as much ground as possible without having to stop and cook and all that. Amen. And then you, and you already answered this one earlier. I was going to ask you what your favorite water purifier is, but you talked about your EpiPen and, uh, yeah, the uh, SteriPen, uh, pin, yeah. yeah, and the Katadyne Hiker, uh, you know, there are all kinds of those little pumps, but, you know, I've had that Katadyne Hiker for 30 years now, and it still works just fine. I've changed the filter cartridge in it a few times, but, you know, it uh, rock solid. So typically when you leave the house, what do you have for everyday carry? Uh you know, one of the good things about the way I live now is I can sometimes go a week or two and never have to leave the property. So I'm, I'm traveling pretty light around here. Uh, but when I go out, you know, I've always got my phone because I'm, I'm a big believer that if you, if you, there, there's a value in having that ability to communicate. You've got this technology, so you need it charged so you can, you know, use it for all the things it's good for, like taking pictures and communication and all that. Um, I'm also usually carrying a, a good folder when I go out, a good solid folder, uh, folding knife. And I have a, a Streamlight micro stream flashlight, which I've, you know, that was one of those things that, it, I was a late convert to carrying a flashlight, but now that I've carried it, I don't know how I survived all those years without it because you find all kinds of opportunities to use it. Um, so I'm a big, I'm a big fan of that. But uh, uh, usually uh, if I'm going out to, depending on the environment, I have a different handgun that I use depending on the season because of how, you know, it fits into the clothing. But, you know, if it's a non-permissive environment, uh, I've got that LCP. If I, uh, 
am wearing lighter clothes. I have a Smith and Wesson shield that I'm kind of a fan of because it's pretty yep. thin. Uh, but I also have a uh, SIG 320X compact. That's my big heavy carry gun. Uh, you know, to me, it, it's pretty much uh, similar to uh, to the Glock, but I hit better with the SIG 320. For some reason, it must be grip shape or my hand size or something. So, uh, you know, it was one of those things that I shoot a lot of Glocks, but I, I hit more accurately with the SIG 320. So I, I, I think that's one of the biggest mistakes that people make is they'll go out and buy a gun simply because of the name or a recommendation from somebody else. And, you know, go to a range where you can rent them and find one that's going to fit your profile of your hand, that's going to, the balance is going to be there. You've got to not only think of that first shot, but you've got to think of subsequent shots as well. And, uh, you know, what is what is the, the re-engagement on the trigger? Uh, I was just reading a story yesterday or today about a police officer, uh, his very first gun battle, um, he basically only got one shot off because he kept trying to pull the trigger, but he never put, he never let it out far enough for it to reset. And uh, so, you know, he never reset that double action after that first pull and he kept pulling and pulling and pulling, but it wouldn't reset. And so he, uh, he was basically losing the gun battle because he didn't reset. Yeah. And, and I'm a, I'm a huge believer in training, but it's, it's like you said, it's important to try guns and find one that fits your hand naturally because then there's a little less uh, training required to grip it naturally and for it to fit well. You know, you don't want to have to train to make it fit. You want a, a gun that fits your hand well to begin with because that gives you an automatic advantage. So my friend from South Carolina has a question for you. And he says, do you know the name of the waterfall up there near the Appalachian Trail? that you can swim under it's that one of the state parks that does i don't know which one that is but it most likely is in shenandoah national park because uh that's in the northern part of virginia but that is the one uh park that has a lot of appalachian trail in it uh there's mount rogers down here which the at goes through it but the AT doesn't have many waterfalls of any size there. So it's probably in Shenandoah National Park would be my guess. But okay. I don't remember it offhand. Does anybody else have any questions here? We are coming up at on an hour. What, right at an hour and a minute. And I only asked him for an hour of his time and he's been so <laughs> gracious. Well, I've enjoyed talking to you. This has been great. I mean, this is not like an interview. This is like two guys hanging out, having a good conversation. Well, I, I do want to make a couple of real quick announcements. And, and uh, while, while you all are thinking of one or two last questions to ask, uh, number one, um, we are going to kind of modify our Thursday night, last Thursday of the month, uh, fiction book club. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to finish up this coming Thursday on the 27th. Uh, we're working on volume nine, if I can find it here. Uh, I can't find it. I had it right here. Uh, volume nine, which is, uh, oh, there it is. Conflicted Home by Chris Weatherman, Angry American. So we're going to do this book review this coming Thursday night. Uh, the book review for August is going to be um, The Borrowed World by Franklin Horton. So I will have a link to get this book uh, underneath in the show notes after we get done this evening. And so we're going to start alternating starting in August. We'll start with one book of, uh, of Franklin's and one book of Chris's uh, and we'll alternate those monthly. And, and we've got, we've only got three or four more in Chris's uh, series. He's up to book 12. I think he's about ready to put it out book 13. <clears throat> and then we can get the, uh, once that happens, then we can focus a little bit more on the different series that, that, uh, that Mr. Horton has. Um, so one of, uh, another book question here from Pepper book club, before we close out, what is your next book project or projects? You know, I've tried to branch out into some other things. I've had, um, uh, I had another series that was post-apocalyptic called the way of Dan that, uh, took place in Idaho. The first book was called burning down Boise, but really the series that I enjoy writing 
and the series that my readers tend to enjoy the most are the series that take place in this one world. So my goal for at least the next year is to focus more on the Borrowed World and the Mad Mick series and uh, get more out. I have uh, Mad Mick uh, 10. Yeah, Mad Mick 10 is the one I'm working on now. That'll be my next release. Um, and then after that, I'm hoping to get a Borrowed World book out before... 2023 is out. So hopefully two more books, one in the Mad Mix series, one in the Borrowed World before the year is out. You're going to have to write the president and get me more money in Social Security so I can catch <laughs> up with all these books. Uh, <clears throat> and and uh, so so don't forget this coming Thursday, we're going to do uh, book nine of, of Chris's Angry Americans, uh, Conflicted World. Then for August, we're going to do uh, the Borrowed World. And uh, you know, there's good opportunity. We might even, after we've read several of these, we might get uh, Mr. Horton back on to discuss uh, some of the character development and things. I'd that be happen. glad to do that. There are, let me tell you, Helen is extremely impressed with how he develops a character just to kill it off. I, I have, uh, you know, the, and, and that happens quite often. But, you know, we were, he and I were talking before the show that happens in reality in life. You know, I mean, just one little thing, like I was I was out in my garage and I just bumped into something, don't know what it was, I got a puncture wound. And uh, within a day, it was so swollen and affected that I got a Rosefin shot and then they almost amputated my leg. And I think that's the reality that he's bringing to our world is that everything is not hunky-dory, little bitty stupid things happen. And the most critical people can be gone in an instant. And uh, that's one of the things that just uh, unbelievable. So, uh, okay, so I got those two. And, and tomorrow night we're doing our last section of our nonfiction book club. So that's, uh, we're finishing up our, our last one of Soko Begovich's uh, The Dark Secrets of SHTF Survival. So uh, we'll finish that book up tomorrow night for the nonfiction. And then uh, for the August nonfiction, we're going to pick up. We're not going to do anything the first week in August. So we give everybody the opportunity to catch up and order the books and everything else. We're going to do Southern Prepper One's uh, Dave Cole's uh, book, um, basically on, on how to build a prepper group. And uh, so I think that's going to be important for all of us. I, I, I had all these books out here and now I can't find any of them. Golly. Oh, well. Um, but anyhow, so that's where we are. Oh, here we go. United We Stand. This is Dave's book. Uh, so this is the nonfiction. We'll start starting around my birthday, I believe, in, in, uh, in July, the second Tuesday in August. Okay. Okay. So with that, thank you so much, Mr. Or any parting words of wisdom you'd like to share be as we uh, get ready to sign off? Well, I really appreciate you having me. If people want to catch up with me, you're welcome to go to my website, franklinhorton.com, and shoot me a message. Uh, you know, my belief is if you can take the time to read my books, I can take the time to respond to your messages. So if you send me an email, if you have a question, I'm glad to answer you. So feel free to reach out, make contact. I'm, I'm glad to speak to you. But I, I'm glad you enjoy my books, and I appreciate you having me on here. So, so one of the things I guess we're going to have to start doing with all of our group here, uh, those of us who are here tonight, is everybody order a coffee makes you poop uh, <laughs> coffee mug. And, uh, and that'll kind of be our, our moniker. When we get together, we'll just all have a cup of coffee with our coffee <laughs> makes you poop coffee mugs. How's that? Yeah, the Mad Mick has his little quirks. And uh, pe people were so interested in those little quirks. That's what led to me opening that store so they could buy their Mad Mick accessories. <laughs> okay. So, everybody, as we get ready to close, I'm going to turn to num Book of Numbers, Chapter 6, verses 24, 25, and 26. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord let his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you kindly and give you peace. So remember... We're all in this together so we can come out the other side together. The only way we're going to do that is please be kind, polite, and respectful to each other because togetherness is what's going to get us through this. Thank you all for being here, and I'll catch up with you here just in one second, Mr. Horton. Okay, take care, everybody. See you tomorrow for the Nonfiction Book Club. Take care. Bye-bye.